All right, you guys ready? All right, now before we go any further, please help me welcome everyone at Peru, everybody online. Put your hands together for them. Yeah. Thank you for being a part of what we have going on here. Now, let's pray, and we're going to get right into it. Father, I thank you for each and every person under the sound of my voice. I pray that you bless them, touch them, minister life to them. Have your way. Have your way in each and every heart, God. I know you will. Change us for eternity, me included, God. Change us all, and I know you will. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, everybody says... Amen. All right, so we're in a series, you know, and we kind of, you know, and here's my theory or thought always whenever, you know, we come out of Easter. Uh, anytime we come out of Easter, I know during Easter time we got people visiting and people coming in and, and you know, and it's always my heart that we would take people that would come in during Easter and we'd give them fast on-ramps to get up to speed spiritually and get them going and get them growing. And so I always want to do something that kind of allows that and allows that to happen. And I think this series is really doing exactly what I wanted it to do because we're talking about the best life. Everybody say the best life. The best life. Do you know that, that in my opinion, there is no life like the Christian life. Living for Jesus, uh, that was kind of partly cloudy there. Uh, I, how many of you know living for Jesus is the best? It is the best, praise God. So that's why we're calling it the best life. And I'll tell you where I got it out of. I got it out of 2 Corinthians 5.15 in the Message Bible, and I love the wording here. Here's what it says. He, being Jesus in the context, included everyone in his death so that everyone could also be included in his in his life. So he died and brought you back to life with him, praise God. You've already crossed over death, and now you're in life. You're in life. Now, a resurrection life, now help me out with these words, a far better life. Come on, everybody say it's far better. It's far better. The life of the Christian is far better, far better. And uh, last week I kind of told you there, there's kind of like three levels of life. There's life, which is existing. You know, and a lot of people are existing. You know what I mean? Uh, matter of fact, everybody on the planet is existing. Oh, come on, that's not that deep, y'all. All right, listen, it, yeah, everyone exists, but you know what? Just because you exist doesn't mean you have life. Doesn't mean you have life. The truth of the matter is it is possible to be alive but not be alive. That's the way the Bible talks about it. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son shall not see life. So it's possible to be alive but not living. So we want to make sure that everybody's living. So, so there's the first level of life. It's living. It's existing. But I will tell you, it's not thriving by any means. Then you have what I call the good life. You know what I mean? And most people will settle for the good life, you know? And you say, well, what's the good life? I gave you a definition last week. I said, the good life is, what? watch this, you look good, you feel good, and you got all the goods. All right? Now, you know, most people will settle and say, well, that's good. Well, the good life is good, but I will tell you, the good life is never good enough. You never become completely satisfied when you just have the good life. So what is the life that we're after? Again, there's nothing wrong with having the goods, but I tell you, if you got Jesus, you got everything. Amen? And everything else in life can be enjoyed to its greatest potential because you got Jesus. Here's the truth. A lot of people have a lot of things, but they don't have Jesus, so they can't even enjoy the things they got. Right? I will tell you, I would rather have less and have Jesus because even with less, with Jesus, it's better than a lot without Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's how I see it. Now, in light of that, let me just kind of go here for a minute. So what I want to do with, with this week and next week is this week, I really want to kind of give you some practical ways in which you can tap into that best life. Okay, next, this week I really want to talk about the physical aspect. Next week we'll talk about spiritual aspect of it. But, but understand this, whenever you're growing in your faith and whenever you're serving God, always understand that there are two levels of everything that operates. And I know sometimes we, we don't separate it that way, but this is the way I do as a, as a pastor, as a leader. I separate it into two worlds. There's the physical things and then there's the spiritual things. Now watch this, everybody. It's, the way it's supposed to work is that the spiritual thing leads the physical thing. But what, what happens is sometimes people will either focus on the physical thing without the spiritual thing, or they get the spiritual thing and won't do the physical thing. And some of you are like, I'm confused on the things <laughs> at this point. But let me explain it to you this way. You ready? Let's talk about something simple that everybody can grab a hold of. Let's talk about like giving to God. Giving. Like being generous. Okay, now watch. 
Let's talk about the physical thing. When it comes to like tithing and, and giving, all right, the Bible says that you're to give your first and your best to God. That's giving. That you're to be generous. As a believer, you're to be a generous person. Can you, can you say amen to that? Okay, now watch. But your giving is supposed to be attached to your heart. And your giving should be from a heart of Lord, I want to be a blessing. I want to bless people. I, I want to do it to honor you. I want to do it for that reason. So there's the spiritual component, the right heart, and yet the physical component of actually doing it. Okay? But do you know that you can do the physical, but if the spiritual isn't right, it's wrong. So, so let, me, let, let me lay it out this way. If you give, doesn't really matter how much, let's just, say, let's just put a dollar amount, five bucks. Let's just say five bucks. If you give five dollars with the idea of, and I'm talking about to the church or to a ministry or to people or whatever the case, you, you give, but you give with, with the heart of, man, Lord, I just want to be a blessing. I, you know, you're, maybe you're walking by somebody at the mall or whatever the case might be, and you give them five dollars because that's what the Lord impressed you to do, so you do it. And you do it from the aspect of, man, Lord, I want to be a blessing. I want to obey you. I want to honor you, so I'm going to give. Do you know what? All those, that's all in alignment. That's good. But you know, you can give the same $5, same action, but the wrong heart. I'm going to give $5. Why? To be seen by people or to, or to make myself better than somebody else or to be seen by men. So it's the same action, but it's the wrong, it's the wrong heart, okay? So there's always this combination of spiritually I need to be aligned and physically I need to be aligned. Does that make sense, everybody? So, so this week, we're talking about the physical. Next week, we'll talk more about the spiritual. But physical things, what are the things that allow us to tap into the best life? Because as we've said, God wants you to live the best life, right? Okay, I lost everybody? Come on, everybody say the best life. He wants you to live that life, all right? He wants you to live that life. So let me give you some things. I'm going to give you four things that I believe with all my heart, everyone in here can apply. Everyone in here. And again, these are easy on-ramps that we can get moving in. Here's the first one. As far as living for God and doing what God, God has called us to do, all right? Check this out. You need to eliminate things that hinder you in your life. If you're going to live the far better life, if you're going to live the best life, you have to realize that there are some things you got to lay down. There are certain things you got to lay down. Some relationships you got to lay down, some sins you got to lay down, some things you got to lay down. You got to lay some things down. There are some things that whenever you became a born again believer and you got on fire for God, you were supposed to leave at the cross and you were supposed to move beyond those things. All right? So what what does it look like? Well, Hebrews chapter 12 I believe speaks to it. Now, Hebrews chapter 11, if you're, if you're looking for a great place to read in your Bible, and it's just a place you want to be encouraged in faith, read Hebrews chapter 11. It's called the Hebrews Hall of Fame of Faith. And it talks about all these men and women of God who overcame great obstacles with their faith. Now, in that, chapter 12, verse 1, talks about looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set, it goes on. But here it is. Therefore, we, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us... Listen to this. Lay aside every weight. Come on, everybody say weight. And the sin. Notice this. I want you to hear this. There's the weight and the sin. Not everything is sin, but some things are just weights. There are weights and there are sins. That which so easily what? Ensnares us. So watch this. And let us run with endurance the race that is set what? Before us. Now, Paul was using the example, back in Paul's day, they had something similar to what we would call the Olympics, and what he was talking about is, there's a great cloud of witnesses. Now, people could argue about whether people from heaven, you know, people that have gone on before us, whether they can see us or not. I'm I'm not here to debate that one way or the other, but here's what I am here to say. We are surrounded by their faith. They did great things and overcame great obstacles, and now we can overcome great things and live in what God has called us to do because we've seen their life as an example before us. Does that make sense, everybody? And now in, in, in this verse, it talks about, but, but if we're going to do that, if we're going to live the far better life, then we have to lay aside every weight in sin 
that ensnares us. And really it was talking about someone running in Paul's day and like the Olympics, losing the backpack of weights and letting things go so that they could be most effective. And I will tell you, you've got to lay some, some things down to live for God, to live all that God has for you. Looking at this, uh, what, what are the things? And I'm gonna give you three. Number one, sins. Sins that hold you back. Anybody believe that there are sins that hold people back from receiving everything that God has? Now, now watch this. It isn't that God doesn't want them to have the far better life. It's their sins that keep them from living the far better life. I know for me, I was in the military. And if you, if you don't know much about the military, let me just tell you this. You ready? They know how to put words together. <laughs> specifically cuss words. They know how to put them together like nobody. I, I know I've heard people say, well, you know, that they cuss so bad they make a sailor blush. I'm like, boy, they don't know the dudes that I knew. No blushing those guys. But here's my point. You ready? I know for me, whenever I got saved and on fire for God, one of the biggest things that I had to lay aside was the sin of cussing a lot. I mean, you don't understand in the military, it's a culture. It's, it's the way people talk, you know what I mean? And, and, and the better you are at it, the cooler you are. All right? Some bravado in it. But, but here's what I'm going to say, all right? I got on fire for God. I got on fire for God. And I've told you guys this before, but it's the truth. You ready? I would start, I'd, I'd, I'd be witnessing to somebody. And I'd be like, man, you need to accept Jesus. I'm talking to him about Jesus. I'd get so mad and so frustrated, I'd start cussing at him in the name of Jesus. How about, how about how, you blankety blank idiot? Don't you blankety blank understand you're going to spend eternity separated from God, you blankety blank? Don't you get it? And can I tell you, I didn't get anybody saved. <laughs> Nobody wanted to accept Jesus. Okay? Now, I say all that to say, listen to this, you ready? I had to lay that stuff down, especially whenever I wanted to be spirit filled and let the Spirit of God speak through me. How I many of you know you can't have? Dirty water and good water coming from the same well. That's the way the Bible talks about it. You got to change the way you talk sometimes. But sins, there are certain sins that will hinder you from receiving the best life. And it's not that God doesn't love you in that sin. It isn't that God loves the sin either. He loves the sinner, not the sin. But I will tell you, your sinning is hindering you. And it isn't because God's just a cosmic killjoy. It's because he knows he wants you to live the far better life, and you cannot be yoked to that and live the life that God has for you. How about this? Activities that are a waste of time and energy. There are certain activities that you should cut out of your life once you get saved and on fire for God. You should cut them out. I know for me, I look at it like this. Does, it, does everyone know what I mean? I heard this years ago, and I use this all the time like in my own process of things. Uh, you know, when you have a heating and air unit, like an HVAC, you know, they'll rate it in BTUs. Y'all know what I'm saying? So like a heater will have like 40,000 BTUs or whatever. You know what I mean? Here's the way I look at it. You ready? Charlie Riley has got each day about 10,000 BTUs to burn. Okay, now watch. But I can't waste 9,000 BTUs on one individual wearing me out over something silly. Or wanting to argue with me about Bible. And again, it's not that I don't want to teach people Bible. That, that, that has nothing to do with it. I'm just saying there's certain things and activities that I just won't spend my time on. Why? It takes up too many BTUs. Charlie, Charlie is in the deficit by the time he goes to bed. Y'all hear what I'm saying? I need a couple days of recouping, you know? But the truth is you only have so much on the inside of you, whether it's energy, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, you only have so much. So watch how you spend your energy and watch how you burn up your energy. Listen to this, habits that hinder, hinder you. You know, there are habits that hinder you. I mean, if every time you get frustrated, you go by the, 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 you, you know, the store and you buy a quart of ice cream and then sit in front of the TV and eat the whole quart, that's a habit. Nobody's laughing, but I... Listen, that, that's a how, if, if every time certain things trigger that, these are things that will hinder you. And it's not that God don't want to bless your life. It's just they're hindering you. Every sin and weight that may, may keep you from receiving all that God has. Listen to 1 Corinthians because the truth of the matter is you're to put off that old person. When you get saved and born again, it should be a line in the sand. And that old person is gone. And you should walk in that new person. You should walk in the new life that God has for you. Listen to it in 1 Corinthians. It says it this way. All things are lawful for me, 
This is the Apostle Paul. All things are lawful for me. Okay, so, so we're talking about, like, you, let's talk about the quart of ice cream. I don't know why. I, I, anybody like ice cream? How many of you are so impatient you put it in the microwave to get the milk going? <laughs> Come on, we do it at our house, too. I'm not, hey, hey, let's just get it to this milky part. It's great. All right, anyway, uh, but, but here's the truth. You ready? <clears throat> if every time you get frustrated in life, you go buy a quart of ice cream and sit there and down that thing, you know what I mean? Again, I'm not against ice cream. It's just an illustration, all right? But, but if every time, I'm not saying that's a sin, but I will tell you it might be a weight. It's definitely going to be a weight <laughs> eventually. <laughs> Come on, y'all picking up what I'm putting down? All right? So, so understanding that there are things that you, that you should not want to do. It goes on, all things are lawful for me, but n- not all things are what? Helpful. You know, um, cussing your neighbor out. I'm not saying you're going to hell for it. How many of you know, if you have asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life, you're on your way to heaven? No, 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 no. I mean, come on, for real. Aren't you glad that our, our activities are not involved in our salvation? That's our faith that is involved in our activity, in, in our salvation. Come on, it's by faith that you are justified before the, the eyes of God. Is that right? It's by faith, all right? Now in that, I'm not saying that your faith didn't, shouldn't encounter your conduct, but you're not saved by good conduct. You're saved by faith. And now at the same time, all things are lawful for me. I can do anything. It isn't gonna send me to hell per se. But I will tell you, not all things are helpful. It's not helpful, it's not productive for me. It goes on, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any, and that's the truth. There is nothing that you should want to be dominating over you. I know about, I don't know, a couple months ago, I went for probably two or three weeks there, I I didn't drink any sweet tea, which for you guys, that may not be a miracle, but for me, it was a big deal. You know what I mean? And, And I didn't. I stopped drinking sweet tea for a couple, uh, for like the first day, and I got a headache, and I thought, oh, no, we're not going to do that. I'm going to stay off of this for a couple weeks, show that it's not going to master me. Do you know what I mean? And now I'm drinking sweet tea again, and if, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> might want to pray for me. <laughs> oh, come on. <clears throat> it's like the guy that says, I quit smoking 15 times. <laughs> You know what I mean? But here's the truth. God doesn't want anything mastering us. That's the truth. Only the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about more about that next week. But listen to this. You ready? Listen to Ephesians 4. It says, but that's no life for you. In other words, God doesn't want that type of life for you. Listen to this. You learn Christ, my assumption is that you have paid careful attention to him, been well instructed in the truth precisely as we have, in, uh, have it in Jesus. Listen to this. Since then, we do not have ex- uh, the excuse of ignorance. Everything, and I do mean everything, connected with the old way of life, it needs to go. Listen to this next part of that same verse. It is rotten through and through. Everything with the old man The old person, before you got saved, needs to be pushed aside. It goes on, get rid of it, and then take on an entire new way of life, living for Jesus. A good-fashioned life. A life renewed from the what? Inside. I love that. Listen to this, everybody. Serving God from the inside is where it starts. It's where it starts. You know, I use the example of me cussing whenever I was in the military, and I'd I try and witness to people, and I get frustrated, and I start cussing. I'm sorry. That's just the reality. You know what I mean? And 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 what what I what I thank God for, I thank God for the fact that He saw the inside. It, y'all don't see it, <laughs> but I thank God that He did, because my heart was I just want to honor God. The problem was I had had so many years of just letting this thing fly. Well, come on, some of you let it fly. But I had to get it under control. I had to get it under control because it was robbing me from the life that God had for me. It goes on, working itself in your conduct as God accurately reprodu- reproduces his character, what? In you. Yeah, let me tell you, 
The Christian life is all about Jesus Christ's character being produced on the inside of you. It really is. It really is. Jesus wants to become mature on the inside of you. So there's the first thing I would say. If you're going to follow Christ and you're going to have that far better life, in the natural, the first thing you need to do is eliminate things that what? Hinder you. Here's number two. You ready? You need to excel in what really matters, which means you're going to have to weigh certain things against certain things. Not everything matters at the same level. Not everything is of equal value. It really isn't. Certain things matter more than other things. Here's the way I look at it. You ready? This is kind of my way of putting it. You ready? You don't need to be good at everything. Watch this. You just need to be good at what really matters in life. You don't have to be good at everything. You have to be good at what really matters. And some people need an adjustment on what really matters. You know what I mean? But you'll, you'll figure it out in life of what really matters. I think about with me and my kids, you know, I'm thankful that I have a wife that loves me and I have two kids that love me. And we're, and we're pretty tight. I, we're so tight, they show up for dinner still every day. <laughs> They're expensive. I just ruined some of you guys' this whole thought of retiring. Because you were like, man, once they're older and they move out, then life's good. No, they still keep coming back. <laughs> All right? Now, I jokingly say that, but that matters to me. I didn't have that as a kid, and I didn't have that with my parents, but that matters to me. But, but let me tell you, it's not that my kids are 25 and 20s. They're older than 25, all right? <laughs> it's not that. That isn't where it started. That isn't where it started. It, this is what mattered. I, gi I give you an example of, of, of how, how you create an environment in your home where at 25 and 26, 27, I don't know, however the old they are, they still want to be around. I, I think of Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving every year at our house was a big deal because every Thanksgiving, up until just a few years ago, we would go hunting every Thanksgiving. Me and Michael, go hunting. There was this one year, true story, we get up, my nephews wanted to go with us. They knew we hunted every, every Thanksgiving, so we're going to go hunt deer hunting, all right? So here's what happened. They, they, they all come over. It's like 5 in the morning, you know, and we go deer hunting that morning. And we went out. Now, if you've never hunted with three young boys, it's not, it's kind of deer hunting. I will tell you, every deer within 400 miles heard us, smelled us, and saw us coming through the woods. All right? Come on, can I get an amen on that? You know what I'm talking about. I mean, it's like ridiculous. But anyway, we went out. Of course, we didn't see anything and all that. So we come home, all right? We come home because every, you know, I always would put the, the turkey in the oven before we'd go hunt, and then we'd come home and be about 1 o'clock, and we'd, we'd get the turkey out, and we're doing all that stuff. So we're all at the house. In the old house that we lived in, we had like a, a quarter-mile drive, all right, and there were three big ash trees in the front. I'm talking big ash trees. And then we had six acres of woods right beside us, okay? So, and there was a creek in the middle of it. So, so we're, we're there at the house. It's 1, 1 1.30. The boys come to me, Michael and my two nephews, and they're like, hey, listen, Dad, you know, can we go hunting? And I'm like, well, I'm not going back deer hunting, <laughs> you know? And they're like, no, no, we want to go squirrel hunting. I go, all right. I said, here's the deal. If you go on the other side of the creek, you guys can hunt in the woods. They're like, all right, Dad. So everybody takes off. All right? So they go out, and they're out in the woods. I'm not thinking anything about it. Here's what I told them before that, though. I had three big ash trees right in the middle of the yard, and I had squirrel feeders on them. <laughs> Some of you know where I'm going already. <laughs> and we're sitting there, and, and I told them, I said, I don't care where you go, just stay over there on the woods, in the woods. And they're like, yeah, all right, Dad, got it, got it. Everybody's clear. All right, clear. So... Half hour, 45 minutes goes by, and I don't hear any shots, and they're, I figure they're just making a bunch of racket over there. There ain't going to be any squirrels over there. But anyway, I, we're sitting there. I still remember this. We're, I'm sitting in the recliner, sitting there, and we have a big bay window. So you can see these three big ash trees. All right, so I'm, I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden I hear pop at one of, the, one of the guns. And I look over, and there's a squirrel falling out of the tree right there. I'm like, what the crud is going on? pop. And as I'm getting up, I hear pop again. I'm like, what's going on? They're popping them off the feeders, you know? And I'm like, what is going on? So I come out of the door. I'm like, what are you guys doing? 
First of all, for all the DNR, that is illegal. <laughs> you can't bait squirrels and then pop them off the feeders, you know? And I'm, but I walk out and they're in the ditch. It's like snipers. They got their rifles down. I mean, they got their, they're right there, boy. They're waiting, waiting for those squirrels to get that pop. I'm like, what are you doing? You can't be doing that. They're like, I'm like, why are you guys out here doing that? I told you in the woods. They're like, Michael, there's no squirrels in the woods. <laughs> now, I say all that to say, what a great memory. <laughs> Not for the squirrels, but, <laughs> but, but you know what I mean? But, but because you value time together. I've heard people say, well, Pastor Charlie, you know, it's about quantity, not quality. And I'll say, no, no, no. You will never find, watch this, quality until you understand quality is found within quantity. If you spend enough time with your family and your kids, you're going to find out there are going to be some really, really cool times. Y'all hearing what I'm saying? See, quality is found within quantity. I think about my neighborhood. We have, and this, they go to our church. I'm not here to call them out or anything like that. But there's one side of our neighborhood every time I turn in. It doesn't matter if it's raining, snowing, sleeting. It doesn't matter if it's 180 degrees or 2 degrees. There is a father outside with his kids all the time in my neighborhood. And I think about it all the time because, you know, my thought process is that's what matters. That's what matters. I know working, you got to pay bills, you got to do all that, but can I tell you what they don't realize, which I know now, what they don't realize is time out in the yard with those kids when they're 8, 9, 10, 12, 15, 16 is going to translate to when they're 30 and 35, they still want to come over and hang out. Y'all hearing what I'm saying? So it does matter. Listen, you don't need to be good at everything, but bless God, get good at the things that matter most. I was thinking about it like this, just within the context of what we're talking about. Listen to this. Manage your time. I'm going to give you three things that should matter to you. Manage your time. Your time matters. Do you believe that? Your time. Where you spend your time, how you spend your time matters. So teach us to number our days. Do you know this, this that once you spend time, you can't get it back? You can't. You know the best use of money is to gain time. It's the best use. Because you can always make more money, but you can't get more time. I know of people who think they got to spend their whole time at work. Again, I know we got to work. My goodness, I know a little bit about working. We all understand that. Everybody understands that. But can I tell you, you can't work your whole life and then when your kids are 40, think that you're going to reconnect with them. It doesn't work like that. You got to pay the price now, especially you young families. Pay the price now of connecting with them because it'll pay you back later. Praise God. You don't have to be good at everything, but you got to be good at what matters, and your family matters. Amen? Think about it like this. Coming to church matters. I know single moms that have to get up and get the kids ready and get them to church, and it's like, oh, my goodness, I'm about to lose my salvation going to church. It's all right. Why? There's a time. Listen, when your kids are honoring God and serving God and not out there in the world doing a bunch of crazy stuff, you're going to realize you saved yourself a lot of time. Time matters. Here's the next one. You ready? This is the second thing I think that matters. Live on purpose. You get to live with a purpose. You have to live with a purpose. Your purpose matters, not just to you, but to other people around you, and you don't really realize this. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. All right? Plans to prosper you and give you a hope and a future, praise God. You know what I mean? Uh, I love Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3, verse, uh, Proverbs 3, verse 5. If you ever want to memorize something, memorize this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will what? He will direct your path. See, what we don't understand a lot of times is that, did you know that your destiny and purpose, other people are affected by it in a major way? I'll, I'll give you an example, a quick one, like here at Abundant Life Church. Um, whenever we were talking about opening this building and we were talking about having a cafe, um, what, I, people are like, did you want a cafe? I wanted a cafe, but let me just assure you of this. I don't want to run one. I'm not even a coffee drinker. Now, I will tell you, since Zoe opened up, I've kind of figured out what I like. But, but, but let me just say this. It was not my dream 
to, to run a coffee shop. But I was talking to someone else, and Jim Regal, man, he's, a, he's an awesome man. He was a manager of a, in, in, the, in the community. And uh, we were talking one day. I was at the business he was working at. And while we were sitting there, and he, he, he was like, so are you going to have a cafe? And I go, yeah. He goes, you know what? I've always dreamed of just running a cafe. I go, really? I think I found a victim. You know what I mean? Now, now, here's what I want you to hear. You ready? It's not my dream. It's his dream. But now watch. My dream of church is helping facilitate his dream of cafe. See, what we don't realize a lot of times is we don't realize that our destiny and our purpose is connected to someone else's destiny and purpose. My, by me walking in my destiny and purpose, I help facilitate other people's destiny and purpose. We think it's just about us, just about my dream and my destiny. No, no, no. What you don't realize is if no one else around you, it's your family and your kids' destiny that you're affecting, the truth of the matter is you're affecting generations right here, right now, and you don't even realize it. Don't even realize it. But you really are. So get this, everybody. Understand when you walk in your purpose, you're actually helping facilitate, who knows, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, a hundred, two hundred, five thousand, what uh, you're helping other people facilitate the mission that God has them on. How many of you know that matters? That matters. You never know the reach that you have. You never understand uh, the potential that you have. So there's the second one. Here's the third one. You need to embrace good priorities because priorities matter. You need to have priorities. You need to know what matters most. Listen to this. For what will it profit a man to, if he gains the whole world, but what? He loses his own soul. You know as well as I know, there are people that will sell out for something and lose and torment themselves. You need to have priorities. I remember one time talking to someone and they were talking to me about, their, long story short, it's a pastor, okay? No one you would know. We were talk, I was talking to a friend of mine and we were talking about this pastor and we asked this pastor, hey, so, so what's your goal in life? I mean, where are you going with all this? And, and he had a big church. And uh, he goes, I don't, he goes, let me tell you something. My whole goal, this was his whole goal. This was his goal. What's your goal? Where are you going with it? He goes, I want to become independently wealthy. How many of you know, as a guy that loves people, and I would do this for free, did it for free. Listen, that's the furthest thing on my mind. I'm trying to get people to heaven. I'm trying to get people on fire for God. I want to see God do big things in their life. Becoming independently wealthy is like the last thing on the agenda list. Come on, y'all getting what I'm saying? But, but my heart is, listen, whenever you don't have priorities, you'll, you'll sell out to certain things that really you shouldn't sell out to because you don't understand what, what the priorities are. You need to make sure you set good priorities. Can I get a big amen on that? need to have good priorities. Here's number three. You ready? Listen to this. You need to embrace new things that God wants to do in you. I know we all get, a, get to a place where we're growing in God and, and we get kind of stagnant. I'm here to tell you, you always want to embrace what God is doing and God is always moving. The Bible says in the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Do you know from Genesis all the way to the end of the Bible, the Bible never says that the Holy Spirit stopped moving. Never stops moving. He's always moving. He's always moving forward and he's always wanting us to move forward with him. We're going to get a little di get bit deeper into that next week. But the truth of the matter is he wants you to move forward. You always got to move forward with God. Listen to this. Isaiah says this. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a, help me out. Come on, say it again. New thing. When's the last time God challenged you? Or when's the last time you allowed God to challenge you? When he said, hey, listen, that attitude, you need to check it. When that, that, that situation, you need to check, hey, let me do this in you. Let me work this out. There should be always something that God's doing in you, all right? I will tell you, you're, we all are like 465 in Indianapolis. I, 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 so I've been in Indiana since I was 10, 11 years old, okay? The only exception to that was four years whenever I was in the military, all right? When I left for the military, 465 was under construction. 
When I was 10 years old and I moved here as a kid in a VW Volkswagen Squareback with my mom, 465 was under construction. When I drove through Indy last week, 465 is still under construction. Come on, somebody. And all I'm trying to say is that you are like 465. You're always under construction, and you just got to know it. We should actually hang caution signs on people. <laughs> caution under construction, you know what I mean? Because we're all still in a process. I don't know of anybody that's arrived. We're all under construction for sure. Now, this is important, and I know it is because I put it there. Okay, listen to this. Spiritual stagnation is never good for you. Spiritual stagnation is never good for you. Here's what I'm saying. You should always want the Lord to be doing something new in you. Now watch this. When you feel yourself getting spiritually stagnant, you need to take an action. Okay? And, and I will tell you, over the years, I've learned just different things. For example, uh, for me, like one of the things I did for years, I don't do this one as much. I do other things. But, but one of the things I did for years, I still like to read a Bible. Okay? So, so even though I preach from an iPad and my notes are on here and all that stuff, I still like a hard Bible to look at. All right? Now, now with that, what will happen is I'll read my Bible so much that I get bored with it. I get to where I memorize where things are on the page. You know what I mean? And I know some of you are like, there's no way. No, for real. You know you can become so familiar with your Bible that you know Matthew 6 is on the left-hand side, second column. You can become that. For I know some of you are like, no, you can. You can get that comfortable. And I'll highlight things. You know what I mean? One of the things I would do a lot of times, especially during Bible college, is I would just go buy a new Bible. If I felt myself getting spiritually stagnant, I'd be like, I need a new Bible. Why? So I can go in there and write all my notes in it and do all that stuff. It stirs me up. And then I start studying more. You follow me? Another things I would do, uh, thing I would do is start turning on some different worship music. Stir myself. I would find a way to push me. For I'd go to a conference. You know what I mean? I'd get around some people that maybe their teaching is different than mine. So I'd go study something like the hydroplate theory or the pre atomite world or what happened to the dinosaurs or what are the pyramids in the Bible or stuff that nobody cares about. <laughs> stuff that I don't preach on. Why? Just to stir me up spiritually. Come on, are y'all picking up what I'm saying? Always allow God to do something new in you. If you find yourself getting spiritually stagnant, let me just say this, you ready? Spiritual stagnation is never good for you. It never works out well. You're going backwards and not forwards. Here's my last one, you ready? These are, and again, these are things that you do in the natural to continue to grow in your faith. And here's the last one. Expect incremental change in your life. Oh my goodness, we could preach on this one for a couple days. I know we like instant everything. We want it now. When I first got saved, they asked me to teach a Bible study at a, at a life group. And I would, I would encourage you if, you, if you want to grow spiritually, get involved with a small group, life group, and I promise you, you'll start growing in your faith. All right? Now, let me say this. You ready? I got, in, I got involved in a life group. And about three months into it, there was a lady who came who got saved in our life group. And within a week, she was prophesying, speaking in tongues, praying for people and everything. Now, you'd think I'd be happy she got saved. I was like, I don't know why she's the favorite God. I want to pray for people. I want to see things. I want you to speak to me. All I do is read your Bible. I read the Bible. Now, I don't get much out of it. I just read it. I don't read it. And you know what? This chick, she, she prophesied both of my kids being born. I mean, she spoke all kinds of things over my life. And I'm like, you haven't even been saved. I've been saved like seven months. You have been saved like three days. <laughs> and, and can I tell you, I wanted it instant. I was like, I want to. Now, now here, here's what I've learned about God, right? The greater the preparation, the greater the call. I was in the oven for a long time. All right? And, and let me just say this. What you have to understand is that if, if it's instant, it's probably not God. If it's quick, it's probably not going to last long. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? So in God, here's what I've learned about God. Slow and steady wins the race. 
Slow and steady with everything. People have asked, Pastor Charlie, do you want the church to multiply like 10 times in one year? No. You say, why? Are you against the church growing? No, not against that. I, I understand how God works. And the way God works is here a little, there a little, step by step, you keep growing. Come on, y'all hearing what I'm saying? That's how your body is made. That's how the Bible talks about God growing something. Think about it like this. This is talking about Noah's flood. Genesis chapter 8. It says, then God turned his attention to Noah and all the wild animals and the farm animals with him in the ship. God caused the wind to blow on the fl flood waters, and it began to blow down. Watch this. The underground springs were shut off, and the windows of heaven were closed, and the rain quit. Now watch this. Inch by, help me out, inch. Slow and steady. Look at this. This is Exodus, the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. It says, and, all, uh, and, and I'll send despair ahead of you. It will push the, the Hevites, the Canaanites, the Hittites out of your way. I won't get rid of them all at once, lest the land grow up in weeds and the wild animals take over. Little by little, little by little. Listen to this, you ready? Mark chapter 4, little by little. And he said... The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night. Watch this. And rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. But how does it happen? And he himself does not know how. For the earth yields its crops by itself. Watch this. First a blade, then a head, and then the full grain of the head. Here's the point. Step by step. Step by step. Oftentimes we want things instant. I want to be a spiritual giant now. No, no, no. Grow steady. Go, grow slow. Let God do a work in you and let it happen. I've told people this. People say, Pastor Charles, I'm not growing. Hold up. What's your reference point? Well, compared to yesterday, that's too soon, too close. You can't really judge it by yesterday. Look back five years. Look back 10 years. Look back 20 years. Look back 30 years. Look back 50 years. That's how you can tell whether you're growing or not. Not yesterday. I would even argue not six months ago. I would say that the best indicator of your growth is probably two or three years ago. Why? Because it's slow and steady. The way God changes things, the way God moves things is slow and steady. And matter of fact, you see it in every area of life. Where instant things happen, oftentimes it doesn't work out good. Anybody ever heard of people hitting the lottery? Do you know that most of the time they're worse off at the end than they were at the beginning? Why? Because it's instant. NFL players, basketball players, how many of them? And I know I probably shouldn't say this, but you ready? I like watching documentaries, and lately I've been watching some WWF documentaries. <laughs> All right? I watched one on Ric Flair. Woo! All right? I grew up watching that stuff. All right? For everybody, my daughter specifically, it's not real. <laughs> but anyway, here's, here's the deal. You watch those documentaries and it's powerful because most of those people, not Ric Flair per se, but most of them are broke, their bodies are torn up, and they're miserable people. They become that person that they're playing on TV and they're miserable people and the people around them are miserable. Come on, are y'all picking up what I'm saying? It's amazing how it works. All right? And I mean, and, and the reality is they were never supposed to be that person. They were never supposed to be that way. But the reality is they did it, and it because it, it becomes instant for them. All right? Watch this. Slow and steady. Take the example as finances, and I'll land the plane here in just a second. Take the example as finances. What does the Bible say about you growing financially over time? Is it better for you than instant? Some of you are like, I wish I had a million dollars. I'd be great. Mm. Watch up. Listen to this. Just, and I'm using this only as an example. Everything in God, he wants you to grow incrementally, not instant. Watch this. This is just money. Money that comes easily disappears. Easy come, easy go. It says, but money that is gathered little by little will, will grow. All right? How about this? Committed, uh, commit, committed and persistent work pays off. Get rich, quick schemes or a ripoff. Like, why would you invest money with Madoff? I mean, the name says it all. He made off with all those people's money. <laughs> Y'all getting what I'm saying? And all I'm saying is, 
You know, right here from the Bible, it's saying things that happen instantly aren't necessarily good. Think about it like this. The trustworthy person will get rich a rich reward. But a person who wants to quick riches will get in trouble. Here's my point. Anytime somebody wants something instantly, it's usually a bad, bad sign. I met people, Pastor Troy, I just need a man. Not today. <laughs> Not today, honey. Not today. You'll know you're ready whenever you stop saying that. When you want it quick and fast, because it doesn't work that way. You got to allow God to grow you over a period of time. Is everybody picking up what I'm saying? So the bottom line is, land a plane. Here's what I need you to know. You ready? Eliminate what does not matter out of your life. Excel in what really what matters. Embrace, come on, help me out, new things and what? Expect slow and steady growth. I believe with all my heart, if you'll do those things, you'll find out that God will do some big things in your life, man. But don't, don't expect to happen overnight. Just slow and steady. God will grow you. God will keep increasing you. Can I get a big amen? amen? Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for your people, and I thank you for all that you're doing in their life, Lord. And I pray that you would, each and every one of us, Father, that you would allow us to, to grow steady, to eliminate things that don't matter, pull in the things that matter most to us, Father, so we can be the best steward of the life that you've given us. Father, we want to tap into that far better life. So, Lord, help us, lead us, and guide us, and I know you will. Lead each and every person, Lord, as they step into it. In Jesus' name, come on, everybody says amen. Would you give the Lord a big clap? Praise God. <laughs>